Hi everyone. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about kinetics. And kinetics is about the rate of chemical reactions. In previous chapters, we've talked about stoichiometry, which allows us to predict how much product we can make from a given amount of reactants. We've talked about thermodynamics, which tells us something about whether the reaction is exothermic and gives off heat when it occurs, or it's endothermic and requires heat to occur. It also tells us something about the relative stability of the reactants and the products in a given chemical reaction. But what we haven't talked about is how fast the reactions go. And the rate of chemical reactions is kinetics. And that's what we're going to talk about in this chapter. So as one example of where um, rate is very important, let's think about a cold-blooded animal like a lizard. A lizard is unable to regulate its body temperature, which means that its body temperature is the same as the temperature outside. And when it's very cold outside, the lizard may be lethargic. In fact, I've even heard that in you know Florida and things like this, lizards can start falling out of trees if they get a particularly cold day um, because the lizard doesn't even have enough strength to hold itself up. Why does this happen? Well, it happens because when the temperature decreases, the... Um, metabolic processes inside of the lizard slow, and the lizard isn't able to move as well. So the rate of the chemical reaction is dependent on temperature. And in this chapter, we're, we are going to learn some of the things um, that do affect the rates of reactions, but we're also going to focus on some of the mathematical aspects of kinetics and in a more um, chemical sense, which is not surprising for a chemistry course. So let's look at this example here of the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. So this is H2O2 hydrogen peroxide, the same stuff that you know you have in your bathroom, um, in your medicine cabinet if you get a scrape, this kind of stuff. All right, and it will decompose into water and oxygen. So if one has a cut, you have um, an enzyme in your body called peroxidase, which present, prevents um, kind of protects you, I guess is a better word, from hydrogen peroxide, because it's not good for your body. Um, so when you put this on your skin, you can see bubbling sometimes, okay, especially if you have a cut. And when you see this bubbling, okay, it's because oxygen is being released. So this is a reaction that you are probably familiar with. But let's look at the rate of this reaction. And this is a particularly long reaction. You'll notice here that these times are in hours. So we have 0 to 24 hours. Well, let's look at what's happening. After 6 hours, the concentration goes from 1 molar to half molar. After another 6 hours, up to 12 hours, it goes from half to 0.25. After another six, it goes from 0.25 to 0.125. And after another 20, and after another six, up to 24, it goes to 0.0625. What you'll notice is the amount of hydrogen peroxide in solution is half after each time period here. But what you'll notice is the amount of hydrogen peroxide that you lost, that was lost in this reaction, is not constant. The first six hours, we lost half of a molar. Okay, if we had one liter, we lost um, half a mole. The next uh, six-hour period, we lost a quarter of a mole, and then an eighth of a mole, so on and so forth. Okay, so although it goes by half each time, the amount lost is not constant. So why is this? Well, this is what kinetics allows us to study. And we could put this information on a graph. And what you'll notice here is that if we look at the concentration versus the time, the rate at which we're losing the hydrogen peroxide is going down. So at the beginning, okay, the tangent to um, the slope here is a much steeper line than more towards the end where the tangent line here, the slope of the tangent line here, is a less steep line. So the rate is actually slowing as time goes on. And what we want to look at is essentially rates of chemical reactions. And what we'll learn throughout this chapter, although it's a little bit too complex uh, for right now, we'll get to it later in the chapter, is how to analyze this to understand the reaction order with respect to hydrogen peroxide. Now, the basic idea here is that the reason that the rate slows as time goes on is there's less hydrogen peroxide there. 
So if hydrogen peroxide has whatever it is, a 1% chance of decomposing, um, because it, you know, it gets hit in the right way by the water molecule. I don't know the exact mechanism of the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, but if it, um, if there's more of it, it's more likely to decompose. So as you get less and less of it, this black line indicates the concentration of the hydrogen peroxide. As there's less and less and less of it, the rate of its decomposition also decreases because there's simply less probability that it'll do what it needs to do in order to decompose. Now, this is not true for all compounds, um, but it is true in this case for hydrogen peroxide. So we'll look at some different examples of that throughout this lecture. So what we need to know is this general equation. So here's what we have. A, little a, is the stoichiometric coefficient, and B, big A is the chemical. Same for little b and big B. So we have A, big A's, and B, big B's, okay? And this is a fictitious reaction. Well, what we want to know here is that the rates of formation of C and D and the rates of um, reaction of A and B can, they're being consumed, so you could say rates of consumption, are all related to each other. And they're related to each other exactly in this way. The rate is equal to negative 1 over little a, the change in concentration of big A, having A in brackets means the concentration of A over the change in time. Okay, to expand this out a, a little bit, it's 1 over little a, the stoichiometric coefficient, times the final concentration of A minus the initial concentration of A divided by the final time minus the initial time, which will give you, of course, the time period, the total time period on the bottom. So this would be the rate with respect to A. You may be asking yourself, why is it negative? Well, it's negative because A is a reactant. So as this reaction proceeds, we would expect we should lose some A because A is going to get for, react with B to form C and D and you're not going to have A anymore. Same for B, it's negative. But C, although the general um, form is the same, is positive. Why? Because C is a product. So we're forming C. And same with D. All right? So this is the general um, rate expression that we can write. Now, what's important to note here is the equal sign between all of these things. Said another way, if I know how fast A is being used up, I can calculate how fast C is being made. Why? Because these things are directly related to each other. All right. If if I one A makes two C's, the rate at which A is getting used up is going to be half the amount that C is getting formed, which is by one over two, right? It'd be half the amount of A as opposed to one over one for C. So that is basically how this works. So because of stoichiometry and because of the way this works, which we talked about extensively before, um, these rates are all equal to each other. So let's look at a couple of examples of this, okay? It says, consider the balanced uh, chemical equation. In the first 20 seconds of the reaction, the concentration of H plus falls from 0.6 molar to 0.38 molar. And as I've done many times before, I'm going to switch this over. It's the same question. I just, I can write on this one. Okay. So it wants to know the average rate of this reaction. Well, what are we looking at? We're looking at H plus. The first thing we want to identify is, is H plus a product or a reactant? H plus is a reactant. So we would expect that H plus is going to be used up. So if we do this, we rate equals negative one over two, because the stoichiometric coefficient in front of H plus is two, times delta concentration of H plus over delta T. And you'll recall that the change in concentration is um, the final concentration minus the initial concentration. And the change in time here is given as a delta t, right? They give you as 20 seconds. Or if you wanted to, you could do 20 minus 0, right? Because we started at 0, so that would be the first 20 seconds. So we need to do negative 1 divided by 2 times the um, final concentration here is 0.3800 molar 
minus the initial concentration here is 0 0.6000 molar divided by the change in time, which again could be 20 minus zero, or you just put in 20 seconds, okay? Because it tells us 20 seconds in the problem. When we do this math, we find that it is 5.500 times 10 to the minus three molar, should be 20.0 seconds, and I guess that should only be that, um, molar per second. Okay, because the time is a measurement, so we do need to consider the sig figs um, in that um, measurement. Now, once we know the rate with respect to H+, plus, we can find the overall rate. And once we have the overall rate, we can find any of the other ones. The truth of the matter is we can convert one to another, or you can convert the overall rate to, to another. And in the second part of this problem, not surprisingly, it asks us to do that. It says, what is the rate of change in concentration of I minus during this period? So we know that I minus and H plus are related to each other. It's going to take 2H plus to do this reaction and 3I minus to do this reaction. Or we can just write the rate expression here for the um, I minus. And for I minus, rate equals negative one over three now, because the stoichiometric coefficient is three, times delta concentration of I minus over delta T. Now what is different here is that this question asks for the rate of change. In most other things we do in general chemistry, we are looking for a single variable, right? We want to find the change in concentration, or we want to find the change in time, or we want to find the rate. We're looking for one variable. But in this case, we want the rate of change. The rate of change is delta concentration I minus over delta T. Said another way, this whole thing all right, I'm going to put it in parentheses, even though it doesn't really need to be. But to illustrate the point, this whole thing is the variable. We're not trying to find the change in concentration of I minus or the change in time individually. We are only trying to find um, this whole variable, the rate of change. Well, now we can plug it in. We know the rate of this reaction is 5.50 times 10 to the minus 3 molar per second equals negative one over three delta concentration of I minus over delta T. It should be delta T, not concentration T. Delta T, like that, all right? So we multiply this side by negative three, we multiply this side by negative three, and when we do that, we get negative 1.65 times 10 to the minus two molar per second. So this is one way that we can apply these rates um, to find the rate of the reaction and the rate of any of the products of the reactants once we know one of the products of the reactants. I will note that this is an average rate, not an instantaneous rate. So this is the average rate over 20 seconds. This is not the slope of the tangent. To look at that, the slope of the tangent line, let's look at another example. Another way we can um, look at this is in terms of instantaneous rates at 500 seconds, okay? So in this example, we're looking at the rate of the um, uh, the rate of each of these reactions at uh, 500 seconds. So if you've had calculus, all right, first derivative, um, we're basically, we're looking at the slope of the tangent line, all right? So here we have the three different slopes of the tangent lines. In this case, ammonia, two ammonia, are being decomposed into three hydrogens and two nitrogens. A couple of interesting things to note about the um, rate at 500 seconds here. Uh, but before we get to that, let's just look at the size of these curves. First thing to notice, okay, the hydrogen curve is much taller than the nitrogen curve. And if we look at our reaction stoichiometry, that makes perfect sense. Why? Because every time two ammonia decompose, we get three hydrogen and only one nitrogen. 
So we would expect the concentration of hydrogen at the end to be higher than the concentration of nitrogen. Specifically, it should be, this should be three to one, the relationship, okay? Or this should be three times higher, however you want to say it. The ammonia is also, it's harder to see because it's not the same direction, right? It would be in here if it was the same direction. The ammonia is being consumed. So these concentrations are increasing, but the ammonia concentration is decreasing. Now let's look at the rates at 500 seconds. If we define the slope of the tangent line here for this one, it's 2.91 for hydrogen times 10 to the minus six. The nitrogen is 9.7 times 10 to the minus seven. This is three times as great as this. Why? Because we form three hydrogens and one nitrogen. In order for this reaction, which has to proceed in the same amount of time total, Right? In order to make three times as much hydrogen as you made nitrogen, you have to form that hydrogen three times faster. So the slope of the line should be three times faster. And at 500 seconds, we sure find that that's the case. So as another way of doing this as an example question, we can look at some instantaneous rates. Okay, It says, um, I'm going to switch over to the camera first here so I can immediately start writing after we do that. Um, it says, given the rate of change of the concentration of H2S, determine the rate of change of the concentration of oxygen. Okay, and we're given H2S plus 4 oxygen yields 8H2O and S8. All right, so we need to look at the rate of change a relationship between oxygen and H2S. And notice we're given a rate of change. So we have those two variables on top of each other again, and this is it for H2S. So let's write the relationship here. Well, let's do it for our um, oxygen first. It doesn't really matter which one we do it first, um, but I have oxygen first. Uh, sorry, it, let's do it for H2S first because H2S comes first. So looking at H2S, we want negative one over eight, why eight? Because there's eight H2S, delta concentration of H2S over delta T equals the rate if you wanted to, or we could just go directly to oxygen, which is not exactly what we did in the previous example, but here we're gonna go directly to oxygen equals negative one over four, why one over four? Because there's four oxygen, delta concentration of oxygen over delta T. Now, we are given this whole variable here. We are looking for, that's why I'm going to put it in parentheses, this whole variable here. All right, we're not looking for the individual concentration or the individual change in time in this case. So let's do this. We plug in negative one over eight we have this variable, so we multiply it by negative 0 0.0041 equals negative 1 over 4 times delta concentration O2 over delta T, like so. All right, so essentially what we want to do is take this, multiply it by this, right, take one eighth of this, and then multiply both by negative 4. So if I multiply this by negative 4, I guess I'll write it this way, times minus four, then I wanna times minus four over here as well to get rid of this. When I do that, I'm gonna switch this over to its own side, okay? Um, delta concentration of O2 over delta T equals minus 2.1 times 10 to the minus two molar per second. So take home message, if we know the average or instantaneous rate of one of the reactants or products, we can find the overall rate of the reaction and we can find the rate with respect to any other reactant or product. And the reason for that is they're all equal to each other.